Hello everyone, my name is Preston Dennett, and welcome to a new episode of UFOs and the Paranormal. Today's episode is called Extraterrestrial Meetings, Five True Onboard UFO Encounters. I love all kinds of UFO encounters. It's the subject I love to cover most, and honestly, my favorite type of UFO encounter are onboard UFO encounters. I like them because as I've said many times, these are the cases that I find the most fascinating, that certainly contain the most information about who ETs are, where they come from, what their agenda is, and what it's like to have ET contact. And there are a lot of cases of this kind, far more than most people realize. And I've said it before, but I think it bears repeating, pretty much everything we know about extraterrestrials comes from cases like these, not from our governments, not from scientists who've never had an encounter, but from the people who've had face-to-face -face contact with ETs. And there's so many different kinds, all humanoids pretty much. We all do seem to share a common heritage, as so many contactees have been told. But there's still a lot of variation between cases, and we always learn something new from each case. I've chosen five cases today, coming from all over the world, and I think you'll find them quite interesting because they reach back pretty early in time, all the way to the 1950s and up through several decades and involve a wide variety of ETs and of course all kinds of evidence. And they are just some really unusual and interesting encounters with a lot of insight into the UFO phenomenon. So let's get started with our first case, which I call Lord Mountbatten's Bricklayer. This is a super fascinating case, which I think is somewhat well known. If you haven't heard of it, you definitely should know about it because it's really unusual, especially given the location of where this incident happened. It occurred on February 23rd and 24th in 1956 in Romsey, England, on the actual estate of Lord Mountbatten of Burma. I think you'll find it a truly fascinating case. This is an encounter which has proved to be something of a headache for the British aristocracy, as it occurred on the estate of Lord Earl Mountbatten of Burma in Romsey, Hampshire, England. And the witness is actually of pretty high credibility. He's more than just a bricklayer. He's actually a former British Army sergeant by the name of Frederick S. Briggs. Now, at the time of his encounter, he was working for Lord Mountbatten as a bricklayer and doing various other odd jobs on the estate. And it was around 8.30 a.m. on the morning of February 23, 1955, and he was on the estate itself, biking near the second gate, when his encounter began. And, actually, at the request of Lord Mountbatten, he did write a very detailed account of his encounter. So I will just quote Frederick Briggs directly. As he says in his own words, I was cycling to work from Romsey. When I was about halfway between the Palmerston or Romsey Lodge and the house, just by where the drive forks off to the Middlebridge Lodge and the house, I suddenly saw an object hovering stationary over the field between the end of the gardens and Middle Bridge Drive and just on the house side of the little stream. The object was shaped like a child's huge humming top and halfway between 20 feet or 30 feet in diameter. Its color was like dull aluminum, rather like a kitchen saucepan. It was shaped like the sketch which I have endeavored to make and had portholes all around the middle, rather like a steamer has. I turned off the drive at the fork and rode over the grass for rather less than 100 yards. I then dismounted and holding my bicycle in my right hand, watched. While I was watching, a column about the thickness of a man descended from the center of the saucer. And I suddenly noticed on it what appeared to be a man, presumably standing on a small platform on the end. He did not appear to be holding on to anything. He seemed to be dressed in a dark suit of overalls, 
and was wearing a close-fitting hat or helmet. At the time, the saucer was certainly less than 100 yards from me and not more than 60 feet over the level where I was standing. As I stood there watching, I suddenly saw a curious light come on in one of the portholes. It was a bluish light, rather like a mercury vapor light. Although it was quite bright, it did not appear to be directed straight at me, nor did it dazzle me. But simultaneously with the light coming on, I suddenly seemed to be pushed over, and I fell down on the snow with my bicycle on top of me. What is more, I could not get up again. Although the bicycle weighs only a few pounds, it seemed as though an unseen force was holding me down. Whilst lying on the ground, I could see the tube withdrawn quickly into the saucer, which then rose vertically quite as fast as the fast jet aircraft I have seen, or faster. There had been no noise whatsoever until the saucer started to move, and even then the noise was no louder than that of an ordinary small rocket let off by a child. It disappeared out of sight into the clouds almost instantly, and as it went, I found myself able to get up. Although I seem to be lying a long time on the ground, I do not suppose in reality it was more than a few seconds. So this was a written testimony he wrote down at the request of Lord Mountbatten. But of course we do know a few further details that were not included in Frederick Briggs' statement. And So this craft was about 50 feet in the air, and as he's watching it, he did notice a trap door of sorts opening up from the bottom section, or it seemed like a portion sort of detached itself, and this revealed the descending column and the platform with the man on it. And he said this man looked human. He was about 5 feet 6 inches, with fair or silvery hair. His close fitting garment was blue in color, and as the column was about to touch the ground, Frederick had the impression that the man was about to step off the platform, but then seemed to change his mind when he saw Frederick, who was by this time almost directly below the object. So this is when Frederick was thrown off of his bike, and interestingly reports being unable to move. That's a detail we see in a lot of accounts. So the object went off, and at this point Frederick rushed to the estate, and was greeted by the Mountbatten chauffeur, who said, quote, You look as if you've had a shock. Now Frederick was friendly with the chauffeur and said, You're never going to believe this, and immediately shared his story. And after Frederick told this to the chauffeur, the chauffeur said, You must tell the boss this. He's interested in these things. And this was true. In fact, it was later confirmed that Lord Mountbatten did in fact subscribe to the UFO journal Flying Saucer Review, and it's well known he expressed a great interest in this subject. Either way, Frederick did not want to share his story, but the chauffeur insisted, and ultimately it was the chauffeur himself who went up to Lord Earl Mountbatten and told him what Briggs had told the chauffeur. So, Lord Mountbatten... Hearing what had happened on his own estate right near him, he took Frederick's story very seriously. He reportedly produced a number of UFO photographs in his possession, showed them to Frederick, and asked him to point to the photo which most resembled the craft he had seen, encouraging him by saying, quote, We know about these things and are very interested in them. This, at least, is what Frederick Briggs told researcher Desmond Leslie in a later interview. So again, Lord Mountbatten had asked Frederick to write down the whole experience, and in fact, afterwards, or around that same time, went to investigate and made his own written statement of the event, which is quite positive in terms of believing what Frederick Briggs experienced. And I'll just quote to you this letter from Lord Mountbatten himself. And I quote, The attached statement was dictated by Mr. Briggs 
to Miss Travis on the morning of the 23rd of February at my request. My own electrician, Heath, reported his conversation, and I subsequently interviewed Mr. Briggs with my wife and younger daughter. And as a result of his account, Heath and I accompanied him to the place from which he saw the flying saucer. We followed the marks of his bicycle in the snow very easily, and exactly at the spot which he described, the tracks came to an end and footmarks appeared beside it. Next to the footmarks, there were the marks of a body having fallen in the snow, and then the marks of a bicycle having been picked up again, there being a clear gap of three feet between where the wheel marks originally ended and then started again. The rear wheel marks continuous but blurred. From then on, the bicycle tracks led back to the drive. The bicycle tracks absolutely confirm Mr. Briggs's story as far as his own movements are concerned. He, Heath, and I searched the area over the spot where the flying saucer was estimated to have been, but candidly, we could see no unusual signs. The snow at the bottom of the meadow had melted much more than at the top, and it would have been difficult to see any marks. This statement has been dictated in the presence of Heath and Mr. Briggs, and Heath and I have carefully read Mr. Briggs's statement, and we both attest that this is the exact story which he told us. Mr. Briggs was still dazed when I first saw him, and was worried that no one would believe his story. Indeed, he made a point of saying that he had never believed in flying saucers stories before and had been absolutely amazed at what he had seen. He did not give me the impression of being the sort of man who would, give, who would be subject to hallucinations or would in any way invent such a story. I am sure from the sincere way he gave his account that he himself is completely convinced of the truth of his own statement. He has offered to swear to the truth of this statement on the oath of the Bible if needed, but I saw no point in asking him to do this. So this is Lord Mountbatten's written statement, which he signed, Mountbatten of Burma. And in fact, below Mountbatten's signature, his electrician, R. R. Heath, also signed his signature and wrote, I confirm that I have read and agree with the above statement. Now, there is one detail which is a bit at odds with this written statement, because according to researcher Desmond Leslie, who interviewed Frederick Briggs, uh, he said that there was a, quote, perfect circle of melted snow in the dell below where the UFO hovered. And after having interviewed Frederick Briggs, Desmond Leslie wrote down his impressions of Frederick, describing him as, quote, a good, honest, down-to-earth fellow who'd had an extraordinary experience which he could not explain. So this experience alone, I think, would be enough to astonish anyone, but events had just begun. This was a face-to-face -face encounter with an extraterrestrial, not an onboard experience, but just wait, there's more because it was the next day that Frederick Briggs had a second and even more astonishing encounter, which he swore to secrecy in terms of being published until Lord Mountbatten passed away. And in fact, he's told the story only to researcher Desmond Leslie. And here's the story. On February 24th, again around 8.30 a.m., Frederick was again biking to work when he came upon the same man he had seen the day before coming out of the saucer. Only this time, this E.T. was standing in the middle of the road as if waiting for Frederick. He was dressed in the same tight-fitting blue jumpsuit, and as Frederick came closer, he signaled Frederick to get off his bike and held out his hand. Frederick strongly shook the man's hand in greeting, Apparently too strongly, because according to Frederick, the man winced slightly and speaking telepathically, in English, to be gentler, and that, quote, we are not as strong as you, please be careful. And in fact, Frederick Briggs told Desmond Leslie that he was struck by the softness and delicateness of the man's hand, 
which he said was as smooth as a baby's hand. So Frederick mumbled an apology, and the man actually led him to the saucer, which had landed a short distance from the house, though apparently still on the estate. Now, Mr. Briggs told Desmond Leslie that he was actually invited aboard the craft by this E.T. gentleman, which he did. He went on board, and inside he found himself in a small room. There was a single chair. There was also a single sort of triangular shaped window against one of the walls, and the man asked Frederick if he would like to take a trip. And Frederick had no fear whatsoever. He felt that the man was very friendly and said that he would be happy to. The man asked him where he'd like to go, and Frederick responded, speaking out loud, and said that when he was in the army, he had visited the pyramids in Egypt and had always wanted to see them again. And this man agreed. And in the space of about 10 minutes, they were there. Frederick looked out the window of the UFO and he could see the pyramids of Giza. And he told Desmond Leslie with a puzzled expression, and I quote, I was able to see them from above and from the side at the same time. So this was somewhat confusing to Frederick Briggs because he's looking at the pyramids from two different angles out of the same window. But he states that he was sure this was not a window or a screen because he was watching the landscape pass by the whole time. So that's pretty much the extent of the encounter. Frederick Briggs was then returned back to England. The saucer landed again on the estate and the ET said to Frederick Briggs, and I quote, if Lord Mountbatten met us, he could change the world. So this entire encounter lasted about a half hour. Desmond Leslie was intrigued by this statement about meeting with Lord Bounton. And after receiving the testimony of Frederick Briggs, he contacted Lord Mountbatten about it. And this is when Lord Mountbatten started to backpedal a little bit and said he was skeptical of this onboard experience. Now, Desmond Leslie found this somewhat strange, considering that Lord Mountbatten had already affirmed in unequivocal rhetoric uh, that Briggs' first encounter was genuine. And again, Lord Mountbatten's interest in UFOs is very well attested. And his daughter, Lady Pamela Hicks, who was there when Frederick Briggs shared his first story, certainly, said that one year earlier, in 1954, she and her father were visiting with King Idris of Libya when the subject of UFOs came up, and the king admitted that he had actually seen two UFOs himself of the, quote, fiery sphere kind. So, the story of the first sighting by Frederick Briggs did receive considerable publicity. But when the second story started to come out, both Lady Pamela Hicks and her father, Lord Mountbatten, both did their best to sort of backpedal the story, with Lord Mountbatten now saying that he thought Briggs' second story was unproven, and Lady Hicks actually went so far as to call Frederick Briggs' story an excuse for being late to work. <laughs> But it's really interesting because behind the scenes, it's apparent that they did believe it. Because musician Molly Thompson, who was quite famous, said that in 1963 she had the opportunity to meet with Desmond Leslie, who told her about Frederick Briggs' story. And she says that she was actually invited to visit the estate of Lord Mountbatten and interview Briggs herself. Unfortunately, she never did this. But it's certainly a good indication that Frederick Briggs was believed about what he experienced. And as for Frederick Briggs himself, he has never wavered from his account and insisted that he is telling the truth. So how about that? <laughs> what an unusual case. I mean, that would have been so awesome to be able to take a trip like Frederick Briggs did, traveling really all the way around the world on board a UFO. It's a shame that there wasn't a face-to-face -face meeting with Lord Mountbatten, 
perhaps there was. If there was, we certainly didn't hear about it. It's pretty clear that they started to backpedal, Lord Mountbatten and his folks, on this case, even though initially they were all in and absolutely verified it. It's one of the things I like about this case is it's so well verified. And it's a really fascinating case, which once again shows that the ETs are aware of our world leaders and have made attempts to contact them. That alone, I think, makes it an important case. And here's our next case, number two in this list of five. And I call this one the UFO Prophet. There are a lot of cases where ETs have given people information about the future. And this case certainly ranks high among them. It's not very well known outside of the country of Argentina where it occurred. The main UFO encounter involving this gentleman, his name is Benjamin Solari Paravicini. Uh, his main encounter occurred on June 4, 1968 in Buenos Aires, Argentina. But it's clear he's had a lifetime of encounters of all different types of entities. He's a very influential figure in his country, and I think you'll find this a truly fascinating case. Born on August 8, 1898, Benjamin Solari Paravicini was the oldest of eight siblings. And from a very young age, Benjamin claimed to have contact with a wide variety of supernatural entities, such as fairies and angels and more. And he displayed really prominent psychic abilities. In fact, he was able to find lost objects and missing people with ease. And he had so many paranormal experiences that his father, who was a psychologist, had him tested extensively to see if there was any mental illness, which of course they did not find. And from a young age, Benjamin also displayed a great talent for art and by his 20s was a very successful artist. He became an art professor and the director of an art gal gallery. In fact, he received a gold medal in Liege, Belgium for his work and was commended by King Albert I, who actually bought one of his paintings and was later congratulated by Argentine President Marcello Torquato de Alviar. But, it was starting in 1936 when Benjamin began producing prophetic drawings, what he calls psychographies, which he says were inspired by his guardian angel. And these are somewhat simple drawings, but they're always accompanied by little writings and what are apparent predictions. And Benjamin became very quickly well-known because his, his predictions were uncannily accurate. In 1938, he reportedly predicted the arrival of television, saying, quote, through small screens, external happenings will be seen at home. Also in 1938, he predicted satellite communication. He did his little drawings and wrote next to it, it comes, a new communication system in the world by artificial planets. So this was his method of apparently accessing his psychic abilities. He would draw a little picture and then make a statement next to it. Again in 1938, he predicted in vitro fertilization, doing his drawings and writing, quote, artificial motherhood cultivated. So he made an enormous number of predictions of this kind. He predicted atomic power, did his little drawing, and wrote, quote, the atom will come to dominate the world. And this proved to be absolutely true. He predicted the artificial heart, and in fact said the heart will be artificial, and gave the year, which turned out to be a very important year in the development of the artificial heart. So he made many, many other predictions, predicting World War II, which was apparently his first prediction, but also the launch of Sputnik II, the 1956 Suez Crisis, the rise of Fidel Castro. A really interesting prediction of his was the fact that the first being in space 
would be a dog, which it was, the Russian dog Laika. He also predicted the atomic bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. He predicted the assassination of John F. Kennedy. And in fact, way back in 1939, he made a prediction about a terrorist attack on New York, actually drawing the Twin Towers. And he wrote, The freedom of North America will lose its light. Its torch won't illuminate like yesterday, and the monument will be attacked two times. So again, all accompanied by drawings. Many of his predictions did focus on his home country of Argentina, but many were about the world in general. And due to the accuracy of his predictions, his fame grew very quickly, and he has often been given the label, the Nostradamus of Argentina. But important here is that, according to his good friend and UFO investigator, Fabio Zerpa, Benjamin claims to have been taken on board a UFO by human-looking ETs. And this occurred on a foggy night on June 4, 1968. Benjamin was walking to his home in Buenos Aires, Argentina after visiting the theater. And as he arrived at the corner of Avenida Belgrano and Avenida 9 de Julio, this was sometime after midnight, in downtown Buenos Aires, Benjamin was suddenly confronted by someone he described as a fair-skinned man who he first frankly thought was a madman. In fact, Benjamin said his eyes were, quote, so light in color that it looked as though he was blind. So the man had very unusual eyes. This man stopped Benjamin, spoke in what he perceived to be a foreign, sort of guttural language. But at the same time, Benjamin was deeply impressed by this man's manner, which he described as, quote, kindly and even gentle. So the man, apparently using gestures, instructed Benjamin to look upward, and hovering about 150 feet in the air, very close to the Argentine Ministry of Public Works building, Benjamin saw a dark, mysterious-looking craft. And the next thing he knew, he was being struck by this huge beam of light. He was overcome with dizziness. And when he recovered, Benjamin found himself apparently inside the craft, standing next to three other human-looking individuals, very much like this first gentleman. Now, Benjamin described this room that he was in as being round. He said there were some glowing panels along the walls, what looked like a central tube in the middle. Benjamin said that these ETs were very good looking. One of them spoke to him in that same strange guttural language. But Benjamin discovered that he was actually able to understand through telepathy. And the man who spoke to him told Benjamin not to be afraid and that they were going to take him on an orbit around the planet Earth, and he would then be returned. And the craft quickly moved off. And, as it did, Benjamin was able to look down and see various countries, including, he says, Japan, France, and Chile. He said this trip seemed to take only a few minutes, and the ETs spoke with him at this point, they told him that they were watching over Earth and protecting the planet from any catastrophes. And they told him, quote, You have to preach love. The universe is harmony. Your behavior, meaning humans in general, your behavior is aggressive. We have several chosen ones. We will meet again. Benjamin says that he was then returned to the sidewalk location, exactly where he had been taken, and more than three hours had passed. So this turned out to be the first of several encounters with ETs. Now Benjamin did continue to produce his prophetic drawings up until his death on December 13, 1974. There are literally hundreds of them. And since then his prophecies continue to unfold. He's very well known. Books have been written about his case. And he has certainly been very influential in his country of Argentina.
So there you go. Another amazing case of UFO contact in which a witness was given quite a bit of information about our planet. And the fact that his track record of predictions is so accurate, I think speaks volumes to the credibility of his case. It's a really unusual case, and certainly high praise to be called the Nostradamus of Argentina. I think his case is definitely worth looking into, with books being written about it, and he having influenced so many people. And it should be very interesting to see if some of his future predictions come true or not. But yeah, a pretty good track record to say the least. And now we move to the next case, which I call Taken On Board. This is a pretty unusual onboard UFO encounter, which took place on May 19, 1978, in the very small town of Emelsyn, Poland. And in fact, this is probably Poland's most famous onboard UFO case, very well investigated, corroborated by multiple supporting witnesses, though technically it is a single witness case involving a gentleman who was taken on board a UFO and had a really unusual experience with these really unusual ETs as well. It's an amazing case. This case is so amazing, probably my favorite of these five I'm presenting today. The main witness is Jan Walski. He's a simple farmer from Emelsyn, Poland, and in fact, he had spent his entire life in his village, never traveling far from it. But it was on the morning of May 19, 1978, that Jan would have an encounter and see things that most people could hardly even imagine. He was not too far from his farm, sitting in his horse cart, heading home, and he noticed two short men ahead of him. Now, he thought at first they might be hunters or something, but upon seeing him approached, they slowed down and they began to sort of move towards him with this strange hopping motion, not normal, and suddenly each of them jumped up on his cart, one on either side. Now this alone wasn't unusual, as people in that area often gave each other rides, but when he saw these men up close, he was very much struck by their odd appearance. Again, each was short, about five feet tall, and as Jan says, they were quite small. I noticed only their faces and hands. They were green. I remember quite well that they had sort of membranes between their fingers. Their eyes were sort of dark and slanting, and their cheekbones stuck out more than ours. Their teeth were very white. Their necks were quite different. They had something like a hump. They wore dark overalls that went from head to toe. And there are other details that he describes. He says that their heads were larger than normal. They did not appear to have whites in their eyes. Their noses were extremely small. They had no hair on their heads. And they began talking to each other over Jan in a foreign language that he couldn't understand. Now Jan realized at this point that this was quite unusual and he became a little bit frightened too frightened to take a good long look at them, so he just kind of kept driving his cart nervously, looking straight forward. But he became even more alarmed when they approached a clearing, and he saw what looked like a sort of bus, quote, hanging in the air. This object was white, it had no markings on it, it had what looked like vertical rotating tubes at each corner, four of them, it was fairly small, about 15 feet long, 9 feet high, 9 feet wide, and it was totally silent as it moved slowly around the area in a hovering fashion. Now as they approached it, these two men motioned for Jan to stop his cart and accompany them to the craft. So he did. They walked together, one figure on each side of Jan, right up to the craft, which was now just... A, a few feet up in the air, and as he watched this, there was this transparent sort of quote elevator type device, which extended from the bottom of the craft almost to the ground itself, about a foot above the ground. One of them stepped up on the platform and gestured for Jan to do the same, which he did. And very suddenly, 
This platform moved smoothly upwards, and Jan found himself inside this small room. And inside, there were two additional short figures looking very much identical to the ones he had already seen. Jan says he felt no fear at this point because they seemed to have a very kind and gentle demeanor. And as Jan says in his own words, the room was dark, no bulbs, no engines, there was nothing. The walls were as if plastic, molded from one piece. There were small pews fastened to the wall. By that he means shelves or, or benches. He says, quote, the light from the outside poured in. The door was also strange. It had no hinges. It scrolled like a carpet. So the beings now instructed Jan to undress. He took off his jacket and he thought that would be enough, but no, they told him that they wanted him to undress completely, take off all his clothes. So he began to undress. They pulled out some what looked apparently was food and began eating it. And through gestures, they asked if Jan wanted to try the food. He looked at it. He said it looked kind of like icicles or popsicles. It was clear, but it crumbled like cake. Unfortunately, Jan declined, so he doesn't know what kind of food this was or what it tastes like. But at this point, one of the beings continued to help Jan to undress by undoing his shirt buttons. And after he was undressed, the beings examined his clothes and they seemed fascinated by his belt and how it buckled. So at this point, two of them held a small disc in their hand, which seemed to actually just stick to their hand, and they used these discs to examine him. They had him lift his arms up. At this point, he could smell a strange older odor, which he kind of likened to burning sulfur. And in fact, it was strong enough that it would linger on his clothes for days afterwards. And looking around the craft, which he said there was really nothing in there, but he did see one thing. He noticed that there was a small group of crows or ravens. But they were not moving at all, just sitting on the floor. Though it was clear they were still alive. So at this point, the ETs seemed to be finished with their examination. And they instructed Jan to get dressed, which he did. And this is pretty much the extent of his experience. He was escorted back to this elevator-like device. He sort of bowed to them, and they bowed back. And this elevator quickly deposited Jan back on the ground. He walked away from the craft, and turning around, he saw that these beings were looking down at him from the doorway. And this craft was still hovering overhead at a very low level. And he didn't see it leave. Jan just turned around to quickly go to his house and tell his family, which he did. He immediately went home, told his wife and his two sons. They, of course, ran outside to see if the UFO was there. But unfortunately, it was not. It was gone. But Jan's story spread like wildfire through the village. And very quickly, people from all over the village came to check on the area. And they did, in fact, find strange footprints on the muddy ground where the craft had hovered, and Jan said he had seen these beings. Jan was absolutely sincere about his encounter, and in fact, he later signed a sworn statement as numerous scientists and researchers came to hear his account. And it turned out that there were other witnesses. There was a six-year-old boy named Adam who was playing outside his home about a half mile away, and he said he saw a very strange plane flying very low to the ground and saw a pilot with a green face inside looking out. Reportedly, there were other witnesses as well, some of who heard strange sounds, some of who apparently saw the craft as well. So investigators found Jan Wolski to be very sincere, very believable. He was, in fact, a devout Catholic. Uh, his case was published in some newspapers who tried to debunk it and say that Jan had seen nothing but a helico helicopter, which is absurd. But nevertheless, Jan's case became very well known. And later, in 2005, as you can see here, there was a small monument put up near the site of his encounter to commemorate his experience. 
and it is perhaps Poland's most famous onboard UFO encounter. Another super interesting case for sure. It reminds me of the Alfred Bertu case in England, because this gentleman also was 71 years old, took the case, his experience in stride, and was very forthright and sincere about it. And all the people who have investigated his case have come away absolutely convinced. And as you saw, there is an actual monument commemorating his case. It's a really interesting onboard UFO encounter. And here is another one, which I think you'll find equally fascinating. Uh, this is the fourth encounter in this little bunch. And I call this one, They Need Me. This took place on June 23rd, 1981 in Stone Mountain, Georgia. It is a multiple witness case. It's a quite extensive onboard encounter in which this gentleman was able to converse with the ETs and they gave him some really startling predictions, which I think we all need to take seriously, given that one of them has already apparently come true. And it's certainly an important case in that regard alone, but the details he describes with his contacts with gray ETs are really fascinating. This case was published in UFO Encounters magazine, and the main witness is a gentleman by the name of Mark James, who reports multiple encounters. But it was an onboard encounter, his first encounter that he knows of at age 18 in 1981, which is perhaps his most significant meeting with these gray type extraterrestrials. It was on June 23rd, 1981. Mark and his then girlfriend Linda were driving to a party near Stone Mountain, Georgia. When they arrived, this party was actually being broken up by the police. So Mark and Linda did not attend the party. They just continued driving. It was a short time later that they pulled over at a cul-de-sac near Martin's Crossing Road, which you can see here. This is a short little road with a lake next to it. And just moments after parking in this cul-de-sac, Mark noticed a brightly lit object in the sky moving towards them at quite low altitude. And he first thought it might be a helicopter, but for some reason, he felt like it was coming for him. And the next thing they knew, they were driving home wanting to get away from this helicopter. And when he dropped Linda off at her home, her father berated Mark for bringing her home so late. This made Mark angry because he didn't think they were late. They had pretty much drove directly home. He hadn't done anything wrong. Uh, and by the time he woke up the next morning, he had really no memory of this experience at all. It was only years later, after further experiences, that he recalled it. He decided to go under hypnosis. And under hypnosis, he did recall this incident at age 18, which resulted in a lengthy onboard experience. Uh, the researcher in this case is C. Lee Culver, and he placed Mark under hypnosis. And this is when this entire onboard scenario emerged. Mark recalled seeing this light, which he thought was a helicopter, get closer and closer. At this point, Linda, his then-girlfriend, began to become fearful. He reassured her, saying, It's all right, Linda. It's just a helicopter. Let's get out of here. And he tried to start the car, but it would not start. And suddenly, this craft was right over them, and it wasn't a helicopter. As you can see from Mark's drawing, it was a large saucer-shaped object with portholes. There was a resonating humming sound filling the air. A brilliant light shone down on them from this object. And suddenly there were five or six short, thin, gray-skinned figures approaching Mark's car. The figures quickly surrounded the car. And although the car doors were locked, the figures opened them easily and pulled the young couple out. Now at this point, the light around them was so bright, Mark said it was like daylight. In fact, he could see the trees and the nearby, nearby lake with perfect clarity. 
He looked over at Linda and saw that she had a sort of dazed expression on her face. The next thing he knew, they were both floating up in the light. And very quickly, they were both inside this craft. Once inside, Mark smelled a musty odor. He said it reminded him of being, quote, under a house. He said the temperature was somewhat cool. He found himself walking down a ramp. He said the walls and floors were made of very smooth gray metal. Two gray type ETs walked on either side of him, escorting him down this curved corridor. At this point, he did see a weird sort of box-shaped device with metal plates on it, which he couldn't describe too well, but you can see his drawing here. And he said it was emitting a loud humming sound. But from there, he was taken into a large, well-lit circular room and placed in a little alcove, or what he described as a holding booth. It was just big enough to hold him. He sat down on this little metal bench, which he said was weird because although it was metal, it seemed to flex to his weight. He noticed that there were about a dozen of these little alcove booths lining the curved wall, and each one of them had a person sitting in them. Everyone that he saw looked a little bit dazed. And just ahead of him, this room actually opened up, and he saw about a dozen examination tables, each was, of which was supported by a single column coming from the floor up to the center of the table. And each table had a person lying on them, while gray ETs examined them. Now this frightened Mark deeply. He told himself, I've got to get out of here. I've got to get out. And he watched as a gentleman was led from one of these little holding booths to an exam table. Shortly later, another person, a pregnant woman, was taken from the booth to one of the tables. He says now he could detect an odor which kind of reminded him of dirty laundry. And this was a big room. He estimates this room was about 60, maybe 70 feet wide and about 12 or 13 feet high. It had a curved ceiling. And as Mark says in his own words, it's a big room, lots of tables, lots of aliens. There are people on them as far as I can see. So the next thing he knew, it was his turn. Two grays came for him. He was led to a table, undressed, and told to lay down on the table, which he did. So the grays began to examine his body, touching him, starting with his feet, moving up his legs. They bent his leg. And James found this interesting because he had this problem with his knee, which would cause it to sort of make a popping sound when his knee bent. And as he says, they seemed fascinated by it. So they continued to examine his entire body, moving from his feet all the way up, up to his stomach, to his chest. During this time, he was unable to move, and he was thinking to himself, I wish they would leave me alone. He said the greys who were examining him were quite short and moved with very purposeful sort of jerky movements. But as he watched, a taller female grey arrived and he said she moved very gracefully among the tables. He looked and saw that she had four fingers, no fingernails. And here's Mark describing what he recalled under hypnosis. As he said, she's coming closer. She is caring, sympathetic. She's trying to calm me down. She's right in my face. She is telling me that I have no reason to fear, that I am needed. They do not intend to harm me. They just need me. I am needed for genetics and future events. Now at this point, the female gray began to speak to him telepathically saying, you must remember this. It is important, very important. And then she started repeating this word, Ebola, Ebola, Ebola. And as Mark says, she's telling me that I am to remember, that it is very important that I remember Ebola. She's close to my face. She's almost touching my face with hers, staring at me, a sense of caring, even loving. So she continued to repeat this word several times. At the time, Mark didn't know what it meant, but later, in hindsight, he of course learned that this was a disease, 
and Mark had the impression that she was telling him about this disease and that it was coming in the future and would be very difficult to contain. Now she held a wand-like device in her hand. At the tip of this wand-like device there was a little leaf-like structure which sort of glowed with light. And she began to move it towards him. And as she moved it towards his forehead, it increased in brightness. And then she tapped his forehead with it. And, as Mark says, it just exploded like a bright light. And this is when another strange image filled his mind. And she was speaking to him. And as Mark says, again in his own words, she's telling me the future. The future, when I am old. So he saw a city, and he recognized it as Atlanta, Georgia. And the scene that he was shown focused on a highway which was filled with cars. And in fact, both lanes were filled with cars, but it was very odd because they weren't going in two directions. They were all headed in one direction away from the city center. And he recognized this highway as Interstate 20. And he saw that the cars were so close to each other, some were hitting each other. And in fact, many people were on foot, loaded with belongings and luggage. And it was a very distressing scene. He began to shake and cry because at this point, he saw a mushroom cloud rising up from the city center. And as he said, under hypnosis, they blew it up. They nuked it. A big mushroom cloud over Atlanta, an atomic bomb. It came down from the sky. They want me to know. Everybody's gone. It's all gone. So this was extremely distressing to him. He was weeping at this point. And this is when the scene shifted to another scene, which showed him with his wife, Janet, who, at that point, he didn't know, but he would later meet. Uh, this scene also showed him with a six-year-old son, Alan, who, at the time of hypnosis was actually only two years old but at the time of the incident he didn't know at all of course but this scene showed him by the ETs showed Mark with Janet and his son Alan having a wonderful picnic along the Chattahoochee River in fact his son was picking flowers while he and his wife ate tuna sandwiches he said this scene felt filled him with absolute peace and joy uh, C. Lee Culver, the investigator of this case, wonders if the ETs are just studying his emotional reaction or if these are actual predictions. In any event, after this scene, the image is stopped and the female gray said, we are almost through with what we need. And at this point, he saw a smaller gray moving towards him with another little wand with a sort of round little BB-like object on the end, which they placed in his left ear and told him that this would help them. Now, next, Mark did say he saw what looked like glass containers along one side of the room. He saw one had a baby inside of it with, quote, a really big head and a really small body. He didn't get a good look at that, but he looked up and saw that the ceiling seemed to be transparent. And he was amazed because he could see this beautiful star field. He believes that next they took a sperm sample. He's not entirely sure, but he was told to sit up and put his clothes on. And this is when he did get a pretty good look around at the room. He was shocked to see so many people in the room, pretty much all of them out of it with dazed expressions. Mark says at this point he was escorted off the table very quickly back down the corridor he had entered at the beginning of his experience. He said at this point he did see what he believed to be a strange marking or symbol on the wall. Uh, it was composed of four dots in a sort of triangular pattern, three making a triangle and one on top, and another what looked like a marking of some kind, which was composed of a curved triangle with a circle inside and a semicircle with two parallel lines inside that, which you can see here. He produced the drawings of this. At any rate, from this point he was led down to the end of the corridor and suddenly he found himself floating in the air quite high above his car. You could see his car, tiny little thing down there. 
He saw his girlfriend Linda. They were put on the ground and placed back in the car. And the ETs left. And he says that he and Linda sat in the car for quite a few moments when suddenly he seemed to wake up out of a trance, turn to her and says, we've got to go. We've got to get out of here. And he started the car, which started up normally, and drove off to escape what he still believed was a helicopter coming for them. And he drove quickly, hoping that it wouldn't follow them. So, that was his experience. But, very interestingly, one week later, on June 30th, 1981, Mark uh, and a neighbor girl named Jan were playing basketball. This is around 9 p.m. And this is when Jan, uh, Jan noticed a figure off in the woods. And this concerned Mark. Uh, he told Jan to go get help. And suddenly Mark felt himself walking into the woods, somewhat against his will. He felt compelled to just go. Jan told him not to, but he went anyway. And he went into the woods where he saw this very small being who was wearing a large hat and a black trench coat that didn't fit him at all. And he saw this was a very skinny being with long arms, and he now recognizes it as a gray, who basically told him that it was time for a quick checkup. And as Merck says in his own words, he's got something in his hand, and he's holding it up to my face. There's a little black thing in the center of it. Uh, this object was circular, the gray held it up to Mark's right temple. Mark had the impression that the gray was taking some kind of reading. In fact, he could feel, quote, little pulses. It was a very quick encounter. Mark was told to exit the woods, which he did. And the only real after effect was that he felt a deep tiredness. But it would be 15 years after his initial encounter at age 18 that James finally sought out hypnosis. And years later, as the ETs had shown him, he did meet his wife Janet, got married, had their son Alan. And when Alan was only two years old, he saw the cover of the book Communion, which uh, Mark had bought. And his son pointed to the picture on the cover and said that the people like that come into his room at night. So this does appear to be a generational contactee case. Interestingly, the d disease Ebola had its first recorded outbreak in 1976, about five years before James was warned about it by the ETs, but long before it had received any real publicity. So this case makes it clear that the ETs are watching over us very closely. A very concerning case, to say the least. Those are some pretty dire predictions, but ETs have been warning people a long time about the dangers of nuclear power in particular. So this could be perhaps what you might call scare tactics to sort of just get people to shape up. Hard to say for sure, but there being so many cases of people being warned of nuclear war and this sort of thing, I think we should take it seriously. Either way, it's definitely an issue on this planet, and it's clear the ETs are aware of it. And now we move to the final case in this little episode, and I call this one, I Couldn't Get Out. And this case, I think, speaks to the fear a lot of people have when they're taken on board, and their impulse to just want to get through the experience. Uh, a lot of people do have fear. It was clear that in this case, I think they were the witnesses, two of them, were simply being physically examined. But yeah, they did find it quite fearful. It took place on June 14, 1986, in Sao Paulo, Brazil. This does to be, appear to be your typical greys. But what I like about this case is it is a multiple witness case. There is some really interesting evidence supporting it. Uh, one of the witnesses has a lifetime of encounters and some really interesting interactions, and at least one of which is pretty humorous, actually. <laughs> uh, I think you'll find it a fascinating case. 
On the evening of June 14, 1986, Bette Rodriguez, then age 22, and her cousin Deborah, age 16, had attended a dance club near their home in Sao Paulo, Brazil, something they have done often. As they were going home, around 11.30 p.m., they noticed a strange light following the bus they were on. It disappeared, and they started walking home after exiting the bus, and this is when this light appeared again and followed them a short distance and then went away. And when they arrived home, both went straight to sleep, which was quite unusual because they usually stayed up and talked about the night. And this was in the days and weeks that followed that they both began to have dreams and flashbacks of meeting gray ETs and being apparently on board a craft. Finally, five years later in 1991, they contacted researcher Mario Rangel, who placed them both under hypnosis and took them back to the night of June 14th. And this is when both recalled a major onboard UFO experience. Under hypnosis, they recalled what they already consciously remembered, seeing the UFO from the bus, watching it pace the bus for a short distance and then go away, getting off the bus and walking home, and again seeing this UFO follow them for a while. But under hypnosis, they now recalled that as they reached Deborah's home on Mira Street in Sao Paulo, they saw this glowing sphere at a very low level in the field next to Deborah's home. Now suddenly in front of them stood a four foot tall figure which they described as looking like a big insect with a huge bald head, dark eyes, grayish green skin, very thin with long arms and four fingers on each hand. He wore a green skin tight jumpsuit. Both described the same details, described this being as being very ugly. Uh, and at this point, this figure started pointing upwards. And the next thing they knew, they were walking into the field towards this hovering object. And as Bet says, we walked even against our will. It was as if something like that called us. No sooner had they reached this craft when a cylinder of light came down and Deborah was floated up into the craft first, followed by Bet, and they both found themselves in this strange round room they were immediately separated and each taken to a different room. Now, Bet recalled being taken to this other room and laid down on a short bed or table. She said it was so short that her feet actually hung over the end. There were three beings with her in the room. One placed this weird sort of bracelet-like device on her wrist, while another began to operate a strange device which was attached to what looked sort of like a computer screen all of which was connected somehow to the bracelet, which is apparently giving some kind of medical reading. Now another being held a small, very thin, almost wire thin rod with a BB-like object on the end, which he stuck up her nose into her sin sinus cavity. And looking at the screen, Beck could see a vivid holographic image of her head, the inside of it, could actually see this rod being placed up inside her sinus cavity. She also believes at this point that they were not only implanting her, but taking a blood sample. This was not particularly a pleasant experience for her. As she says, I wanted to get out of there. I wanted to move to get out of there, but I couldn't get out of there. I was so terrified to be in that place. So this exam was fairly quick. After it, they removed this bracelet-like device, told her to get off the table and get dressed. Bet asked them who they were, why she and Deborah had been taken. As far as she know, they didn't answer, or she doesn't remember them answering, but she did believe that they told her she wouldn't remember. Now, one of the beings did stare at her very closely and deeply without saying anything, and Deborah reports the same sort of thing. And the next thing they knew, they were back in the field without knowing how they were returned. The UFO was gone. They ran home. Inside their home, they found that they were very thirsty. 
both consumed two glasses of water then two glasses of juice so that's bet's recall deborah deborah's recall matches bet's deborah recalls being taken up inside this craft via this beam of light she remembers being separated from her cousin and taken into another room where she was placed on not so much a table but a chair with her arms sort of strapped to the arms of the chair she saw that the walls of this room had what looked like buttons and tv screens the ets examined deborah's body with great interest and showed equal interest she said in her clothes she says she believes they took a blood sample and the screens which she didn't get a good look at but she believed they were showing the results of her physical examination she said she could hear the ets talking in this very rapid clipped language to each other which she couldn't understand she did ask them what they wanted and why she was chosen but she says the ets did not answer at one point this chair sort of reclined into a table and the exam continued now deborah doesn't remember undressing for this exam suddenly she was just without clothes and she also noticed that after the exam she suddenly found herself dressed without knowing how her clothes were put back on so her recall does not appear to be fully complete but the next thing she knew she and deb uh, she and bet were walking home so bet also record recalled other experiences as a young child which began when she was around nine years old when she saw this black sort of globe shaped object hovering overhead and it wasn't long after that that she saw another gray being in her home at age 14 she had a very interesting sighting where she saw lights hovering over a hill in front of her home and she actually waved to the lights at which point one disappeared and suddenly reappeared right in front of her quite large she saw a face of a gray appear and this et asked her what do you want from us and she replied i don't want anything and the et sort of scolded her and said well if you didn't want anything why did you call me and she said well i called you as a joke she did not think they would respond but they did uh, this entire conversation was telepathic there is a lot more to bet's case uh, again, this was investigated by Mario Ron Hell, who published this case in one of his books, but it's certainly a very interesting case. I think that's a fairly typical onboard encounter, but certainly interesting. I thought it was particularly fascinating how Bet, one of the witnesses, described how she could see the inside of her body due to the ETs projecting the image of her head that's something that does turn up in a number of cases medical instruments that sort of show a holo holographic image in live full color of what's going on inside a person's body I mean, there's some really interesting facets to that case for sure and it's pretty well verified as well it's one of so so many cases that are going on on our planet so those are the five cases I wanted to present to you today. Once again, they show exactly what it's like to have contact. And this is just the tip of the iceberg. These five cases, you could times that by 100,000 easily. And you, I still think there would be more cases. Uh, most, of course, of which have gone unrecorded, unfortunately. That's partly our own fault for allowing this government cover-up to go on for so long. Thankfully, that is changing. We're seeing great strides in moving towards truth and transparency. I'm still not convinced our governments will ever be honest on this subject. We have no real signs of it. So ultimately, it's up to each of us, every individual, to do what they can to learn about what's going on on our planet, which is the primary reason why I do these videos. I've also because they're just darn interesting. <laughs> this subject is so expansive. There's just so much to learn from it. And when you look out and see all those stars at night, 
there's no doubt that we are not alone. And it's awesome to know that we have people watching over us who are much more advanced than we are and certainly have something to teach us. So that's it for today. I want to thank you once again for watching. It's always very much appreciated. I love all of you very much and really am thankful that you join me each week for this little show. So until next time, keep searching for the truth, keep asking those important questions, and most important of all, keep having fun. I will see you next week. Bye now.